ne participere in et spiritus sancti. Amen. In the year 1195, in Portugal, uh, St. Anthony of Padua was born, and uh, his name was Ferdinando, um, actually was his given name by his parents, and he chose the name Anthony later on, as we'll see. When 15 years old, he became an Augustinian canon at his local church, um, which is just a cleric in, in residence there in the church, and by the age of 19, he was ordained a priest. I don't think this was due to any particular sanctity on his part. It was just the way they were doing things at the time. Uh, so for several years, he studied theology. And um, actually, he at a certain point, he moved from the original church where he was a canon. He moved to a, a different church a little further out because too many of his relatives were coming to visit him and talking politics and family business and these affairs and was distracting him from the service of God. So it was taking his, his uh, 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 um, ordination of priesthood, uh, his, his clerical status, he was taking it seriously. Well, he was, uh, his desire for God continued to grow, and um, uh, just a few years later, I think it must have been the year 12, um, maybe 1212, something around that time, um, he, uh, there was in his city a procession of the um, remains of five Franciscan monks who had been preaching the gospel in Morocco and were martyred there by the Muslims. So their, their bodies were brought back to Portugal, and there was a parade in their honor through the streets, and it was at that moment when young uh, Ferdinando decided he wanted to become a Franciscan. So he went to the Franciscan order. He asked to transfer over there uh, to join them uh, with on one condition, if you allow me to go to Morocco and preach to the Muslims. So they agreed, and then he, he asked the Augustinian canons. They said, okay, you can go join the Franciscans, and so he did. And he went to a, um, uh, he did a, a bit of time, like a, a retreat, and upon joining the Franciscans, he, that's when he chose the name Anthony, after actually St. Anthony of the Desert was, was what he'd chosen it after. Uh, so St. Anthony uh, travels to Morocco. He's ready to preach. He is ready to be martyred for uh, the faith. Uh, but God had other plans, as he usually does. And um, uh, St. Anthony grew very sick upon arrival, and um, they put him back on a boat uh, back to Portugal. Thus ended his desire for martyrdom, or rather his, his opportunity, we could say. Uh, but the, uh, the boat, uh, because of a storm, was not able to return to Portugal, but ended up landing in Italy. And he was still sick, he was still needed to recover. So he stayed there with some uh, Franciscan monks. They built him a little, little hermitage, and he was um, uh, praying, reading the scriptures, um, you know, meditating, doing menial tasks. Uh, just very, living a very, a very penitential, very um, um, solitary life, much after the, um, his patron saint, Anthony of the Desert. Well, um, he may have remained uh, unknown there, and he's in early 20s at this point, I think, but the um, uh, company of Dominicans uh, visits these, these Franciscans, and both of these orders were newly formed, right? The Franciscans were, this, this is in the year like 12, maybe um, 1220 something, 12, eight, you know, something like that. The Franciscans were formed in 1209, so like barely over 10 years old, um, similar with the Dominicans, a newly formed order. And the Dominicans were, were known when they were founded for their preaching. So the Dominicans show up, and the Franciscans are like, okay, they're going to preach the sermon. Uh, the Dominicans are like, well, we're not ready. Well, you're all going to preach the sermon. And so nobody, nobody knew who was going to preach the sermon, right? So what do you do in those cases? You pin it on the little guy. So St. Anthony of Padua said, why don't you give a sermon? He'd never given a sermon before, didn't have any training, didn't have any time to prepare, so, but he'd been studying scriptures, right? He loved the Lord, he, he'd been in solitude. So he gets up and he delivers like the best sermon anybody ever heard. Everybody was astounded. Uh, they were completely not expecting that. So from that moment forward, uh, they began to task him with preaching because it was so good, and it was very effective. Uh, he was like um, uh, another saint who was renowned for uh, unexpected preaching ability was St. Bernadine of Siena, if you remember. Um, and and St. Bernadine had a style of preaching that was very um, appealing to the common people. He would, wasn't using the exalted rhetoric of the day, uh, but just very, very simple, very direct, very understandable. And St. Anthony of Padua was the same way. 
very simple, uh, both the learned and the un uneducated appreciated these sermons for their clarity and directness. Uh, so he began uh, 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 to, um, to preach, and in, in fact, um, because of his knowledge of scripture, St. Francis of Assisi uh, put him in charge of instructing uh, incoming new monks um, in, in scripture and theology and so on. Now, um, he is known, as we know, as St. Anthony of Padua is also known as, you know, the, the, the uh, patron saint of lost causes, right? We have that prayer, dear St. Anthony, right, for a lost item. So the way that that started was um, St. Francis, or St. Um, um, Anthony had a book of the Psalms. He had a little Psalter um, in which he would write down his notes for teaching and for preaching and so on. And this is before the printing press. So this manuscript is copied by hand, very valuable book, um, and, and also because it was, it was his notes. It was basically his, uh, his laptop of the day, right? All of his preaching notes were there. Well, one of these young novices whom he was instructing decides that he'd had enough of this, this order. He didn't want to be a monk or a cleric anymore. And furthermore, um, he took the, the, the book. I mean, this is, this is I mean, these days, that, that's going to be like near, nearly um, a half a year's wages, right? So this is thousands and ten thousand dollars in, in today's currency. So this young novice takes the book and, and flees the uh, monastery. St. Anthony realizes what happens. And so he kneels down and he prays for God to return to him um, the, the Psalter. And so um, after a very short amount of time, that young uh, novice comes back, returns Anthony's Psalter to him, and says, on my way, uh, an angel appeared to me holding an ax and said, if I didn't return the book, he was going to kill me. So here I am. Uh, so St. Anthony, and, and then he stayed, right? That novice stayed. It left quite an impression on him. So, uh, so St. Anthony, by his prayer, recovered both a lost book and a lost soul. So that's why he is now the patron saint of, uh, of lost um, items. <clears throat> uh, another time, um, <laughs> he, he kind of related to the, the, the patron saint of lost souls, is, is at this time the Albigensian heresy was, uh, uh, um, we could say that was the problem of the day. It was in southern, southern France, I think also called the, um, uh, the Cathars. It was the name of the religion or their heresy. And it was just basically um, warmed over Gnosticism. Good, there was a good God uh, and an evil God, and they were at war in the universe, and mankind was in the middle, and this is, this is the, the, what their heresy was preaching. Um, but St. Anthony was very effective in bringing them back to the faith, these Albigensian heretics. Uh, but not, it wasn't always easy. At one point, he went to a town uh, to preach, and the townspeople would not even let him begin. And so uh, St. Anthony's like, well, I came here to preach. So he goes to the ocean and starts preaching to the fish. And they all swim up to the shore and poke their heads out of the water and listen to him until he finishes, and then he gives them a blessing, and then they all swim away. Right? At that point, the townspeople were like, okay, I guess we'll listen to you now. Right? So that's the, the miracle of the fishes. Um, also, he was um, invited to dinner by some of these heretics, and they poisoned his food. And uh, as Anthony sits down, he realizes what has happened, and he confronts them. It's like, you know, you poison my food, and they admit to it, and then they have the, the, the audacity to say, well, if you really believed, you'd eat it anyways. So St. Anthony uh, says a prayer. He blesses the food and eats it and is completely fine. Much the amazement of those of those uh, uh, those um, Albigensian heretics. So this is in part what what converted them back. Um, he traveled all over uh, preaching, was teaching. Eventually, he was made provincial superior of the Franciscans in 1226 at the age of 31. So he chose Padua as his location. This is where he was going to administer the province. And he, he'd been, you know, he, was, he hadn't been back to his hometown, Portugal, since he'd left, really. Um, he hadn't chosen, he hadn't been in any specific place. So Padua was the first, you could say, local area to, to which could identify itself and associate itself with St. Anthony. That's why he's known as St. Anthony of Padua. It was really just the first place that he kind of called home, um, even though he only spent five years there. He was provincial superior for about five years, uh, but again, he grew sick, um, and um, uh, eventually he died there in Padua in a, um, uh, in a convent, a poor Clare convent. Uh, so he is, I think, might hold the world record for the fastest canonization ever. 
in that he died on this day in um, when, when what was the 1231. So he died on uh, June 13th, 1231, and he was canonized on the 30th of May, 1232. So not even one year, and that was by Gregory the Ninth. And this may be more of a testament to Gregory the Ninth than Saint Anthony, but earlier when Saint Anthony had had been preaching, even the Pope had heard that uh, of his abilities. So he was in, he was sent to the um, uh, the Vatican as an envoy, and he preached before the people there, and they were um, amazed beyond what they had even expected. I mean, he had he had a, a, a big reputation, and they were expecting a lot, and they got even more. Some of them once said that the effect uh, was like a second Pentecost. Um, his, um, uh, his sermon, they said that day, was a jewel case of scripture, and Gregory IX uh, called him the Ark of the Testament. So the, the Pope commanded him to write down his sermons, which he did, and we have, um, one of them is called Sermons for Feast Days. So we have some of St. Anthony's uh, sermons. <clears throat> uh, but so he was canonized very quickly by Gregory IX, and uh, 30 years after his death, his body was exhumed, and his, his corpse had corrupted, uh, nothing left but the, the skeleton, except for St. Anthony's tongue. It was still um, incorrupt and moist, which had preached and converted so many souls. Uh, so you may see uh, icons of St. Um, Anthony, and he'll be um, uh, either preaching to the fishes, right, or he'll be holding a book uh, and, and some lilies, and, and you know, that, that lost uh, psalter, or lilies for purity, purity of heart, purity of intention, but he's also, you'll see him holding uh, the Christ child. And this actually came about in that after his death, uh, someone came forward and said that uh, when he, Anthony had been visiting their house, they'd seen a glow of light in the room and they came and looked in and they were seeing Anthony holding the Christ child uh, in his arms. So um, uh, another testament after St. Anthony's death of his sanctity during life. Uh, so, um, you know, a very well-known saint in the church, and with good reason, as we've seen. And, uh, you know, that, that, is what, that is what comes when we give ourselves to Christ. As I mentioned in, in art, he's depicted holding lilies, a sign of purity. And, and that is uh, the result of that, right? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And, and that's where St. Anthony's, uh, we could say, his simplicity and his effectiveness came from, is he saw clearly. He saw God everywhere. He saw him in the scriptures. He saw him in, in, in nature, right? He saw him in the fish. He saw him in the heretics, right? St. Saint, Saint Anthony of Padua saw God everywhere, and, and that, is, that comes from his purity of heart. Uh, so that is the example that we can follow. Uh, perhaps, you know, I would say all of us, that's a gift that God gives every child who enters into the world is purity. Purity of heart, purity of intention, uh, but the corrupting influence of original sin, uh, um, uh, you know, the choices of sin, actual sin, the bad example of the world, uh, our original uh, purity that God intended for us is corrupted. But let us re-find it, right? Let us ask St. Anthony of Padua, right? Dear St. Anthony, uh, come around. I've lost my purity and it can't be found, right? Purity of mind, of heart, of soul, of body, whatever it may be, uh, um, that is what we can ask St. Anthony for. Uh, cleanse out my... Um, um, disordered desires, my selfishness, right? And let us choose uh, uh, purely the love of God alone. Let's ask St. Anthony for that intercession. God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.